Dear students, in this session, we discuss about colorimetry and flame photometry under instrumental methods of analysis. First, we start with colorimetry. We try to understand what is this colorimetric method, for what purpose we use colorimetric uh, technique, and we also take the example of colorimetric estimation of copper. Thereby, we try to understand how this colorimetric technique is advantageous, how it is being used to estimate the given sample. When it comes to colorimetry, colorimetric technique is mainly used in order to estimate the concentration of chemical species present in the colored solutions. Generally, there are some chemical species which can be naturally colored in nature and there are some chemical species which will become colored upon making them to react with some other chemical species. So, in the case of these colored solutions, we can use colorimetric technique in order to estimate their concentrations in the given solution. But, in order to estimate the concentration of any chemical species even when they are present in the colored solution, the point here is the uh, those color, color of intensity of the color of those solutions must be varied, must be varied with the change in concentration of the solution. Either, either along with increase in concentration, either the intensity of the color should be increased or decreased. Only in such a case, only in such cases, we can use colorimetric technique, colorimetric method in order to estimate the concentration of those species in the respective colored solutions. And what we do here is we once the intensity of the color of the solution changes with change in concentration, what we do is we measure the concentration, we measure the intensity of the color of the solution by observing, by observing or by measuring the amount of light absorbed by that particular colored solution. How much, if the, how much is the amount of light absorbed by the uh, colored solution? By measuring that, we measure the intensity of the color, thereby we measure the concentration of the given chemical species. And in order to measure the amount of light absorbed by the colored solution, we take the help of the instrument what is called as colorimeter. So, therefore, overall the colorimetric technique is used in order to estimate the concentration of the given chemical species in its colored solution. In order to do so, the condition is the intensity of the color of that chemical solution must be varied with the variation in concentration of the chemical species. There are some chemical species, they may be naturally colored. There are some other chemical species which may be colored, which may get color upon making them to react with some other chemical species. And the intensity of the color, intensity of the colored solution is measured by measuring the amount of light absorbed by that particular colored solution. In order to measure the amount of light absorbed by that colored solution, we take the help of the instrument called as colorimeter. And the entire concept, the entire concept, the amount of light which is being absorbed by any colored solution is governed by what is called as Beer-Lambert's Beer law. So, we try to understand how Beer-Lambert's law talks about the relationship between the amount of light absorbed by any colored solution and the concentration of the colored solution. So, we know that whenever a monochromatic light of intensity I0 is incident in a transparent medium, that is whenever a monochromatic beam of light of intensity I0 is incident on a transparent medium, a part of the light is going to be reflected, a part of the light is going to be absorbed, we call it as Ia, a part of the light is going to be reflected, we call it as Ir and the part of the remaining part of the light is going to be transmitted, we call it as It. Therefore, I0 is equal to Ia plus Ir plus It. I0 is the intensity of the total intensity of the uh, incident radiation. Ia is the part of the radiation which is being absorbed. Ir is the part of the radiation which is being trans, uh, reflected and It is the part of the radiation which is being transmitted. But here we are passing the monochromatic light beam of radiation on 
a transparent medium through a transparent medium for any transparent medium or a transparent medium like uh, the glass medium a transparent glass for the transparent glass air interface the amount of light reflected is very very negligible therefore we can neglect this therefore we can write it as i not is equal to i not is equal to i a plus i t i a plus i t so total amount out of the total quantity of the light passed or incidented a part of the light is going to be absorbed a part of the light is going to be remaining part of the light is going to be transmitted and i t by i not is equal to t it is called as the transmittance and log 1 by t is equal to log i not by i t it is called as absorbance and the relationship between the absorbance and the concentration of the given chemical species or chemical solution is given by beer lambert's law the relationship between the absorbance a concentration c and path length is given by beer lambert's law this law says that a is equal to log i not by i t that is equal to epsilon c t where epsilon is the molar extension coefficient which is a constant for a given substance at a given wavelength at a given wavelength epsilon is always a constant for a given substance and if the path length is kept constant a is proportional to c this is what is called as beer lambert's law a is equal to epsilon c t which is called as beer lambert's law it says that absorbance of the light by the given solution is directly proportional to the concentration of the given solution provided the path length is kept constant for that matter whenever in during the colorimetric estimation of any given chemical species we prepare series of solutions of varying concentration of different concentrations thereby each solution is having its own color its own color with its own intensity and thereby each solution absorbs different quantity of light but when we measure the absorbance of light uh, absorbance of light is each of each colored solution we take that solution in the same testing tube or in the same test tube or in the same cuvette we call it as so that thereby the uh, the path length the distance traveled by the light through the solution is always same for all the solutions that's why while carrying out the colorimetric estimation path length is always going to be constant so that means in a tube like this a rectangular tube like this it is called as cuvette it is called as cuvette it is called as cuvette so inside this transparent glass tube called as cuvette we are going to take the colored solution therefore solution a where the concentration is suppose let's say 0.1 molar solution 2 where the concentration is 0.2 molar 0.3 molar etc for each solution we take in the same cuvette it's a transparent glass tube transparent glass tube same cuvette therefore the light traveled when and we are going to pass the light here the light traveled in each case is same therefore path length is constant path length is same that's the reason the absorbance of the light by any given colored solution is directly proportional to concentration of the chemical species along with the concentration intensity of the color of the chemical species also changes when the intensity of the color changes absorbance also changes so therefore the beer lambert's law says that absorbance of light by any given color solution is equal to epsilon ct where epsilon is the molar extension coefficient which is a constant for a given substance at a given wavelength therefore when we measure uh, when we carry out colorimetric estimation for any given chemical species the chemical species is same and we measure the absorbance of light by that chemical species at, at a given wavelength only therefore at a given wavelength at a given for a given substance epsilon is constant and t is path length it's also constant therefore according to beer lambert's law absorbance of light by any colored solution is directly proportional to concentration of the chemical species when the concentration varies intensity of the color varies thereby the absorbance also varies therefore absorbance of light by any given colored solution is directly proportional to concentration of the respective chemical species which is responsible for the color 
So, this is the basic theory behind the conduction of colorimetric estimation. Therefore, overall as of now what we try to understand is colorimetric estimation or colorimetric technique is used to measure the concentration of any chemical given chemical species in, it, in, its, in its colored solution. The condition is that given chemical species color intensity of the color of the given chemical species must be varied with the variation in concentration and thereby we measure the intensity of the color of the intensity of the color of the chemical species at different concentration by measuring the amount of light absorbed by that particular chemical species. In order to do so, we take the help of colorimeter and this colorimeter and the entire concept is based on Beer Lambert's law. Beer Lambert's law says that amount of the light absorbed by any given colored solution is directly proportional to the concentration of the chemical species. Therefore, when we plot absorbance against concentration, when we plot absorbance against concentration, we are going to get a straight line, we are going to get a straight line. Okay. And coming to the instrumentation, how this instrument looks like. So, this is the photograph of the uh, uh, colorimeter and colorimeter will be consisting of these many parts. There will be a lamp, from this lamp a beam of light is being produced okay. and that beam of light is passed through a monochromator, uh, passed through a monochromator. Monochromator is also called as a filter what this filter will do out of the beam of light what is the exact wavelength required for example uh, here the beam of light is produced out of the lamp the moment you switch, switch on the instrument inside the instrument there will be a lamp lamp will be on and a beam of light is produced a beam of light is the combination of various wavelengths okay if various wavelengths and suppose imagine for a given chemical species we need a wavelength of around suppose suppose let's say 560 nanometers in that case if we set the filter like this or it is also called as monochromator or the filter, we, if we set the filter accordingly, the filter what it will do, it filters out all the other wavelengths of the radiation, it allows only the radi uh, light of wavelength of 560 nanometers. This is the role of the filter. Therefore, in the colorimetric instrument, there is a lamp, there is a monochromator or a filter, lamp, the moment switch on the instrument, out of lamp will be on, a beam of light is being produced, the beam of light will just first, first passes through the monochromator or the filter, the filter filters all the other wavelengths except the required wavelength and a required wave, uh, the, a beam of radiation, a monochromatic beam of radiation of required wavelength comes out of the filter and that will pass through the sample cuvette. The sample cuvette, that is what I told, a transparent glass tube, it is called as cuvette. So, the monochromatic beam of radiation will pass through the transparent, transparent cuvette. Inside the cuvette, we are going to take the sample. We are going to get the uh, solution of the chemical species, whichever we are analyzing. And this solution, as we already know, it, is, it will be colored. It will be having some color, blue color or red color, whatever it is, depending upon the kind of the chemical species we are analyzing, it will be having its own color. So, beam of this monochromatic beam of radiation passes through this cuvette containing the chemical solution. So, therefore, a part of the light will be absorbed by the solution, remaining part of the light will be transmitted. The transmitted light will be detected by the detector, the signals will be amplified finally in the display window, how much of the light is being absorbed by the solution or how much of the light is being transmitted out of the solution is shown in the display window, is shown in the display window. This is how the instrument works. If you look at the photograph, so this is the display window and this is the knob to set the reading to 0, standard setting to 0. This is the filter that is monochromator. This is the filter in order to set the uh, uh, filter to a desired wavelength level for whichever the wavelength, whichever the wavelength we want for the upcoming uh, passing radiation, whether we want the radiation or the light of uh, wavelength uh, 620 nanometers, 560 nanometers, 460 nanometers, depending upon to set that there is a filter and there is a sample cuvette. In, in this, there is a hole here where we have to keep the cuvette through which the light passes, through which the light passes thereby light passes here, detected by the detector and the amplified signals are amplified finally in the display window, how much of the light is being transmitted or absorbed will be shown. So, by using, by observing, by noting down the amount of light which is being absorbed by each colored solution having different concentration, we can 
be able to find out the concentration of the same chemical species in the unknown solution or in the test solution. So, this is what about the instrumentation of the colorimetry. What are the applications then? Very simple to understand already we know. So, the concentrations of metals like iron, copper, manganese etcetera or non-metals like fluoride, sulphate present in very small quantities in solutions or soil samples and alloys can be estimated by colorimetric techniques. So, when we talk about water chemistry, we gone through various parameters, right? In those parameters, what should be the maximum level of sulphate which can be present in water? water. What, can, what could be the maximum level of fluoride which can be present in water? Suppose some water sample is there, you, you need to test the amount of fluoride present because fluoride is present in water. If we are drinking that water, it leads to teeth decaying and all those things. So, that is the reason here we can use colorimetric technique to estimate the amount of fluoride present in any water sample, amount of sulphate present in any water sample, amount of iron, copper, manganese etcetera present in some ores, some soil samples, some alloys also. For example, uh, we want to measure the amount of copper present in certain alloy, then we can use this technique or we come across new ore, new ore of iron for example or new ore of manganese for example and we have a very small amount of the sample present and in that ore what is the amount of iron present we can find out by taking the help of colorimetric technique. So, advant another advantage is even at low concentrations that is the major advantage actually one is it is accurate another one is even when the any metal suppose any metal any species present in very low concentration we can measure it accurately with the help of colorimetric technique. Now, we will see uh, how to carry out colorimetric estimation of copper by using colorimetric technique. A colorimetric estimation of copper means what? That is you will be given with copper solution, some copper solution and uh, you will not be knowing, you will not be knowing how much of copper or copper, suppose imagine you are given with copper sulphate solution, you do not know how much of copper is present in that solution, you have to find out by you taking the help of colorimetric technique, colorimeter in thereby you can find out the concentration of copper in the unknown solution of copper sulphate. So, similarly any copper solution given to you, any iron solution given to you, any manganese solution given to you which is colored in nature, you can find out their concentration by using colorimetric technique. Here we see how to use this colorimetric technique in order to find out the concentration of copper in any unknown solution of copper. Let us say there is a copper sulphate solution where we do not know the concentration of copper in that copper sulphate solution. We have to find out by using this colorimetric technique. What is the theory behind this? Very simple. Whenever any solution of cupric ions, copper sulphate or copper nitrate, whatever it is, when, co when copper sulphate solution is treated with ammonia, is treated with ammonia, what happens is copper reacts with ammonia, copper ions present in copper sulphate react with ammonia forming cupramonium sulphate or cupramonium ion and cupramonium ion is a deep blue colored compound. All of you know that copper sulphate itself is a blue colored compound. You take copper sulphate crystals dissolved in, when you look at the copper sulphate crystals themselves they are blue in color and when you dissolve in water you are going to get blue colored solution. To that if you add ammonia, the copper ions react with ammonia forming cupramonium ion and the blue color becomes deep blue, darker blue, intense blue. That is the, that's the point. Therefore, that is the point. Therefore, if you add ammonia, if you add ammonia to any copper solution you are going to get dark blue color and more is the amount of copper sulphate. Suppose imagine there is 2 ml of copper sulphate solution to that you are adding ammonia, you get dark blue color, you get blue color, deep blue color and another so another beaker you are having 10 ml of copper sulphate solution to, your, to that you are adding same amount of ammonia there you are getting much more darker blue color because in the second case the concentration of copper is more. So, wherever the concentration of copper is more in the given copper sulphate solution you are going to get more and more darker deep blue color more and more darker blue color that is the basic idea behind conducting the experiment colorimetric estimation of copper and the intensity of the blue color proportionately varies with the concentration of copper that is right. 
more of more copper is present more is the intensity of the blue color and cupramonium complex absorbs radiation of 620 nanometer wavelength actually the meaning of that says see you are having copper sulfate solution with you and it's basically blue in color to make the result more accurate you are you are trying to make the blue colored copper sulfate solution to be, to be much more darker blue by adding ammonia the moment you add ammonia reacts it ammonia reacts with copper ions forming cupra ammonium thereby the color becomes much more darker blue more is the concentration of copper in the given solution more will be the darkness of the more will be the darkness of the blue color for example you have two cases case number 1 you are suppose you are having 2 ml 2 ml of same, some copper sulfate solution 2 ml of copper sulfate solution to this you are adding ammonia getting deep blue, deep blue color and another case you are having 5 ml you are you are adding 5 ml of the copper sulfate solution to that 5 ml of the copper sulfate solution you are adding ammonia then you are getting much more darker blue color darker blue color so in this way difference along with the difference in concentration of copper sulfate solution you are going to get different intensity of the deep blue color and this deep blue colored cupramonium sulfate solution absorbs maximum light whenever the wavelength of the incident light is 620 nanometers i repeat once again this cupramonium ion solution deep blue colored solution absorbs maximum light whenever the wavelength of the incident light is 620 nanometers whenever the absorbance is maximum whenever the absorbance of light is maximum the result will be more accurate that's the reason whenever we use colorimeter in order to measure the concentration of unknown uh, copper in the unknown solution unknown solution of copper sulfate or any other copper solution we measure the absorbance of light by different solutions at 620 nanometers that means whenever we use the colorimeter for this purpose we operate the colorimeter by setting the wavelength at 620 nanometers clear no that's the meaning when we say the uh, the the absorbance of light is maximum by cupramonium solution at 620 nanometers therefore we entire carry out the entire experiment by using colorimeter by setting the wavelength at 620 nanometers to set the wavelength at 620 nanometers as we discussed here we have monochromator or filter so therefore whenever we carry out the colorimetric estimation of copper by using colorimeter we set the filter this is the filter we set the filter at 620 nanometers therefore when you switch on the instrument a beam of light enters into monochromator this monochromator or the filter filters out all the other wavelengths and allows the radiation of wavelength only 620 nanometers the ray the beam of light of 620 nanometers only passes through the cuvette containing cupramonium solution this is the meaning so now coming to the procedure so what we understood as of now uh, we were discussing about colorimetric estimation of copper the principle behind that experiment is copper solutions on treating with ammonia forming cupramonium ion complex the complex is deep blue in color and the color of the intensity of the deep blue color depending upon the concentration of the copper solution depending on the concentration of copper solution and this deep blue colored cupramonium solution absorbs maximum light at 620 nanometers therefore we carry out the experiment by setting the wavelength at 620 nanometers in any given calorimeter in any given calorimeter okay so now coming to the procedure so what we do we take we will be having a standard solution of copper sulfate its solution its concentration will be known to us from that copper sulfate solution we take 2.5 ml copper sulfate 5 ml copper sulfate 7.5 ml copper sulfate 10 ml copper sulfate into four different 50 ml standard flasks okay we take we will be having 2.5 ml we will be taking 2.5 ml of copper sulfate solution 5 ml copper sulfate 7.5 and 10 ml into four different flasks each flask is of 50 ml capacity each flask is 50 ml standard flask and another flask fifth flask flask number five we are going to take the test solution test solution means same copper sulfate solution but unknown quantity we may be we may be given with 5 ml or 6 ml or 7 ml or 3 ml 
or 8 ml whatever it is, but we do, will not be knowing how much of copper sulphate solution is given in the test solution flask. That flask is also of the capacity of 50 ml. Okay. So, we take in the beginning 6 50 ml flasks. First 4 flasks we are going to add 2.5 ml, 5 ml, 7.5 and 10 ml of copper sulphate solution into 4 different flasks. And for the 5th flask, 5th flask we are going to take the same copper sulphate solution, but how much is taken will not be known to us. We have to find out how much is taken or how much is given in the test solution flask after conducting the experiment. Clear? No. So, then another sixth flask what we do, sixth flask what we do, we take only 5 ml of ammonia. We will be having 1 is to 1 ammonia solution. We will be taking only 5 ml of ammonia in the uh, sixth flask, flask number 6. In this way, totally 6 flasks we are going to take of 50 ml capacity each. First 4 flasks we are going to add 2.5, 5 ml, 7.5 and 10 ml of copper sulphate solution. Fifth flask we will be adding or we will be given with certain unknown amount of same copper sulphate solution. Flask number 6 only 1 is to 1 ammonia will be taken. Then to each flask, each flask we will be adding 5 ml of ammonia. 5 ml of ammonia into this flask, this flask 5 ml of ammonia, 5 ml of ammonia, 5 ml, 5 ml also and another sixth flask number 6, six already we have added 5 ml of ammonia. The moment you add ammonia what happens? Ammonia reacts with copper sulphate solution taken in this flask forming cuproammonium ion and thereby light color of the copper sulphate solution changes to deep blue color. Light blue color becomes deep blue color and 2.5 where only 2.5 copper sulphate solution is taken here you will be getting some deep blue color whereas here you will be having highest intensity of the darkest deep blue color you are going darkest blue color darker dark blue color normal dark or lighter blue color bit dark darker darkest therefore out of these four different flasks then wherever you have taken highest amount of copper sulphate solution you will be getting darkest blue color and this will be lighter blue color among these four that means as we already understood intensity of the blue color is depending upon the concentration of the copper solution concentration of copper more is the concentration more is the intensity of the blue color therefore out of these four flasks the 10 ml flask will be having highest intense deep blue color lowest intense deep blue color among the four will be of 2.5 ml flask and test solution flask we do not know how much is given it will also be generating deep blue color its deep blue color the intensity of the blue color is depending upon the amount of copper sulphate given it may be between 7.5 and 10 suppose if 10 8 ml is given it will be between 7.5 and 10 if it is 6 ml given it will be between intensity of the blue color in the test solution flask will be between 5 and 7.5 ml and so on but we do not know exactly we may just get an idea roughly but to find out it exactly we have to conduct the experiment. So, what we have done? We have taken 6 different flasks. First, flow, first 4 flasks we are going to take different amounts of copper sulphate and uh, flask number 5 we take certain unknown amount of copper sulphate. Flask number 6 nothing is taken. To all the 6, six flasks then we are going to add 5 ml of 1 is to 1 ammonia. The moment we add ammonia, ammonia reacts with copper sulphate solutions forming cuproammonium ion. Thereby, we are going to get deep blue color of different intensities. Right. And flask number 6 will not be having any color because in the flask number 6, we do not have any copper sulphate. Only ammonia is taken. Therefore, it is colorless completely and colorless completely. Therefore, it is called as blank solution. Therefore, it is called as blank solution. Then what we do? To each flask, we add water up to the mark, up to the mark. Thereby, we prepare 50 ml of the solution. Exactly, we add water up to the mark, close the lid, shake it well for uniform concentration. Thereby, we will be having 50 ml solution in each flask. 50 ml solution here, 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 10 ml test solution as well as blank solution, we will be having 50 ml. Once we do so, then you have to measure the absorbance. Before measuring the absorbance, what we have to do is, we have to set the reading to 0. So, in the cuvette, in the cuvette, first you take the blank solution, 
blank solution is colorless right blank solution is colorless in nature keep the blank solution in the cuvette and set the reading to zero and you set the filter to 620 nanometers because we have to measure the absorbance in the case of copper solutions at 620 nanometers because at 620 nanometer only the absorbance is maximum in the case of cuprammonium ionic solution so therefore in the in the manochromator here the filter set the reading to set the filter to 620 nanometers and in the cuvette you take blank solution blank solution is colored in is uh, colorless in nature being colorless it is transparent being transparent it should not absorb anything it should only transmit completely therefore you, it, it, the machine should show the reading as zero absorbance for blank solution set the reading to zero by using the set zero button set the reading to zero by setting the reading to zero the machine now is ready for further estimation further calculation further measurement and you may get the doubt here when we try to measure when we try to set the reading with uh, to zero with the transparent solution in the blank uh, for that purpose we are using blank solution uh, for the purpose when we are using uh, for this purpose when you are, when you are using blank solution uh, instead of taking ammonia we can take only water no that's the question you may get uh, for the because for the blank solution also we are adding 5 ml of ammonia and for all the other solutions we are adding 5 ml of ammonia same quantity the reason is for the blank also we are adding 5 ml of ammonia and set the reading to zero because by any chance if ammonia ammonia contains any colored impurity to nullify that effect to nullify the absorbance of light by any colored impurity if it is present in ammonia to nullify that we take 5 ml of ammonia along with the blank and set the reading to zero. That's the purpose. We take ammonia there in the blank solution. That's the reason why we take same amount of ammonia for all the different flasks. 5 ml of ammonia only for all the different flasks. So in this way, we prepare the solutions. We prepare the solutions. And what we do, first we take the blank solution in the covet, set the reading to zero. Then you take 2.5 ml of the solution, set the uh, 2.5 ml of the solution in the cuvette, note down the absorbance. Switch on the instrument, instrument is switch on, switched on already, the filter is set to 620 nanometers. Then what you do, you take 2.5 ml solution, set the uh, 2.5 ml solution in the cuvette and keep the cuvette in the cuvette holder and the machine will show how much of the light is being absorbed by 2.5 ml copper sulphate solution, note down the reading. Then you keep 5 ml solution, then you throw, then you throw out the 2.5 ml solution, wash the <coughs> cuvet with water and rinse the cuvet with 5 ml solution and keep the 5 ml solution in the cuvet. Note down the absorbance of light by 5 ml solution, 7.5 ml solution, 10 ml solution. Finally, note down how much of the light is being absorbed by the blank sorry test solution how much of the light is being absorbed by the test solution in this way what you are doing for each solution how much of the light is being absorbed you are measuring with the help of the colorimeter at 620 nanometers at 620 nanometer you are measuring the amount of light absorbed in each case in each case naturally the 2.5 ml solution of copper sulfate wherever you have taken that will be having lightest deep blue color Therefore, it will be absorbing less quantity of the light. Highest quantity of the light will be absorbed by 10 ml solution because the intensity of the deep blue color is more. More darker is the color, more light will be absorbed. Okay. So naturally, that's what the so that's what the reason Beer Lambert's law says. When the path length is constant, the absorbance of light by any colored solution is directly proportional to the concentration of the chemical species. Here the concentration is highest, therefore, more light is absorbed. Concentration is lowest less light is absorbed. Similarly, certain amount of the light, similarly, certain amount of the light is being absorbed by test solution also. Note down all these things. Then finally, you plot a graph of absorbance of light by the solutions against the concentration of copper in the given solution. When you plot a graph of absorbance along the y-axis and concentration of copper along the x-axis, so for 2.5 ml solution, what is the absorbance? What is the absorbance of light? You are putting the point 
For 5 ml solution, what is the absorbance you are putting the point here? For 7.5 ml, what is the absorption you are putting the point? For 10 ml, what is the absorption you are putting the point? Then what you do? You draw a straight line to pass through the origin. You draw a straight line passing through this maximum possible number of points, also passing through the origin. After drawing the straight line, for the test solution, you do not know the concentration, right? But for the that is what our purpose, our purpose is to find out the concentration of copper in the test solution or in the unknown solution. So, for the test solution, we do not know the concentration, but for the test solution also, we have measured the absorbance, right. So, for the test solution also, we have measured the absorbance. So, along the y axis, what is the absorbance for test solution? Locate the point. From there, you draw a perpendicular to touch the curve. From there, you draw one more perpendicular to touch the x axis, to touch the x axis. That means, so, here it is the absorbance of the test solution. From there, you, dry, you are drawing a perpendicular to test the x axis curve. Thereby, you are drawing one more perpendicular to test the x axis. This is the point. This is the nothing but the concentration of copper in the test solution. In terms of volume, suppose in the graph it is shown it as 6.3 something. So, 6.3 cm cube of copper sulphate solution is given to you. You will not be knowing how much is given to you. In a 50 ml flask, some copper sulphate solution will be added and it will be given to you, right? And you will be asked to find out how much of copper sulphate is given to you. So, by conducting the experiment, suppose in this case, it is coming out as 6.3, therefore volume of the test solution is 6.3. Once we know the volume, we can calculate concentration of copper in 6.3 cm cube of copper sulphate by uh, in terms of milligrams of centimeter cube because whatever the copper sulphate solution which is given for us, which is given for us in preparing different solutions of 2.5 ml, 5 ml, etc., we will be knowing the concentration of copper in those copper sulphate, in the, in the stock solution of copper sulphate. So, if we know that, we can convert this volume into concentration, thereby we can calculate concentration of copper in terms of milligrams per cm cube. So, this is how dear students, we can find out the concentration of copper in the unknown solution of copper sulphate by using colorimetric technique. So, we prepare different solutions of different concentrations. To each solution, we add ammonia, thereby we get dark blue color. Similarly, test solution also we add ammonia, then we prepare one blank solution, set the reading to 0 with blank solution, then for each colored solution, we measure the absorbance at 620 nanometers including test solution, then we plot the graph of absorbance versus concentration and you get the points like this. Dry a straight line to pass through maximum possible number of points and also pass through the origin. Then for the test solution, we do not know the concentration, but we know the absorbance. So, locate where the absorbance is there for test solution. From there, you draw a perpendicular, one more perpendicular here, where it touches the x axis. That is nothing but volume of copper sulphate in the test solution. Once you know the volume, you can easily calculate concentration of copper in that particular test solution. This is how with the help of colorimetric technique, we can estimate copper in the test given test solution or in the given unknown solution. We will be knowing copper is present there, but we do not know how much of copper is present, we can do that. Similarly, by using colorimetry, we can find out the concentration of various species in their respective colored solutions. No. So, this is the concept. In order to understand the concept, we took the example of colorimetric estimation of copper. So, now we move on to the one more technique under instrumental methods of analysis, flame photometric technique or flame photometric estimation or the entire concept is called as flame photometry. So, while we were discussing about colorimetry, colorimetric estimation is dependent upon the concept that there are some chemical species, they are colored in the respective solutions and the intensity of the color varies with the variation in concentration. Whereas, when it comes to flame photometry, there are some species like sodium, potassium, calcium, lithium and some other elements, they will impart some colors to the Vincent flame. 
there are some elements like sodium, potassium, calcium, etc. They impart characteristic colors to the Bunsen flame. For example, sodium imparts a golden yellow color to the Bunsen flame. Suppose if you keep sodium into the Bunsen flame, the Bunsen flame instead of burning with blue flame, it starts burning with golden yellow flame. Potassium imparts lilac color, whereas lithium imparts a crimson red color, etc. So, in this way, there are some elements which imparts characteristic color to the Bunsen flame. Whenever these elements are exposed to the Bunsen flame, they, they will be introducing, they will be imparting uh, characteristic colors to the Bunsen flame. And the intensity of the color of the flame is depending upon the concentration of these elements in the species, in the given solution, in the given solution or in their given form. More is the concentration of this. For example, you are impart you are introducing sodium solution solution of sodium into the Bunsen flame the naturally the Bunsen flame starts burning with golden yellow color and the intensity of the golden yellow color is depending upon the concentration of sodium in the given solution more is the concentration of sodium then the Bunsen flame starts burning with more intense golden yellow color so therefore the concentration of these elements concentration of these kinds of elements which can impart color to the flame they can be measured concentration of these kinds of the elements can be measured by using flame photometry method or by using the instrument called as flame photometer so when we were discussing about colorimeter colorimeter technique is used in the case of chemical species which are colored in their solution form right colored in the solution form and intensity of the color of the solution in changes with concentration whereas flame photometric technique is based on the concept that there are some elements which can impart color to the Bunsen flame and the intensity of the color imparted to the Bunsen flame is varying with the variation in their concentration. So more is the concentration more will be the intensity of the respective color by using this concept by using this variation we can measure the concentration of these elements in the unknown solution unknown solutions of unknown solutions by using flame photometric technique. So now this flame photometry, uh, how, what is the theory behind this? What actually happens? So when any solution, for example, sodium chloride solution, imagine that solution of the, when that sodium chloride solution is, uh, uh, when we are introducing this solution into the flame, into the Bunsen flame, what happens is in the beginning solvent evaporates out. The sodium chloride solution you are taking, the solvent there evaporates out, leaving behind only solid sodium chloride residue. The solid then will be vaporized in the Bunsen flame. All these things happen one by one in, in few fraction of seconds. So the solid then will be vaporized and it will be dissociated into its respective atoms. That is, if you take sodium chloride solution and uh, exposed to the Bunsen flame, what happens? The, in the solution, solvent first evaporates, vapor, evaporates out, leaving behind only so sodium chloride solid, and that sol sol sodium chloride will be vaporized, will be converted back into its gaseous form, and in the gaseous form, then it will be dissociated into, into its respective atoms, sodium and chlorine atoms. And these sodium and chlorine atoms, uh, whatever the electrons which are present in these atoms, they will get, a, they will get jump to the excited state, higher state, from the ground state and these electrons or these atoms which are excited to the higher state as all of us know they will not remain there they come back to their lower state immediately when they are coming back from excited state to ground state what they do they release the when they are jumping to higher energy level higher state what they do they absorb the energy from the Bunsen flame when they are coming back from higher state to lower state, excited state to ground state, they release the energy which they absorb during the upward jumping and they release the energy in the form of radiations, in the form of radiations and those radiations released by these sodium atoms will be having the wavelength of golden yellow color. Therefore, when they release the radiation of the wavelength of golden yellow radiation, the entire Bunsen flame looks like having golden yellow color. This is the basic theory. This is the basic idea how, how the Bunsen flame gets some characteristic color. Clear? No. And this entire thing is being represented here. So you, you have a solution of some salt, 
sodium chloride solution, you may be having sodium chloride solution or potassium chloride solution, whatever it is, you are exposing that solution into the flame. The flame first, the solution first becomes, uh, get the form of a mist, then the solvent evaporates, then sodium chloride becomes sodium chloride solution, becomes sodium chloride solid, solid gets evaporated to form, uh, to uh, get go, go back to the go to the vapor state or the gaseous state. In the gaseous state, the solid of sodium chloride, if you take the example of sodium chloride, we can take other examples also. Sodium chloride dissociates to give sodium and chlorine and the sodium atoms will absorb the energy from the flame further, they get excited. These excited sodium atoms will not remain there, they come back to the lower state. When they come back to the lower state, they release energy in the form of radiations and whatever the radiations released out of these sodium atoms will be having the wavelength of golden yellow color. Therefore, entire flame starts burning with golden yellow color. This is how any, this is how in the case of flame photometer, whenever any, uh, whenever solution of any given element exposed to the Bunsen flame, how the Bunsen flame starts burning with or how these elements impart color to the Bunsen flame, this is how it happens. First, the sol solvent evaporates, then it becomes solid, then vaporizes to go to the gaseous state, then dissociation, then these elements will get, atoms of these elements will get excited and de-excited in the flame and during that process, radiation will be released and the released radiation will be having its own wavelength. Sodium atoms will be releasing the radiation. Uh, having the wavelength of golden yellow color, whereas uh, the lithium atoms will be releasing the radiations, having the wavelength of crimson red color, crimson red color and so on. In this way, you are going to get characteristic color to the Bunsen flame. This is the concept behind that. And how many atoms, when you are exposing, when you are introducing any solution, any solution containing sodium or potassium or lithium, etc., these kinds of elements, into Bunsen flame, how many atoms will be excited, how many atoms will be still in the ground state and uh, it also depending upon the concentration etc. So, that is being given by a relationship called as Boltzmann equation. So, that is the relationship between the ground state and the excited state. So, how many atoms are in the ground state, how many are there in the excited state? Whenever you are introducing any solution into the Bunsen flame, that will decide the intensity of the color of the flame. That is given by the Boltzmann equation. It says N1 by N0 is equal to G1 by G0 to the power of E uh, into E to the power of delta E by KT, where N1 is the number of atoms in the excited state, N0 is the number of atoms in the ground state. G1 by G0 is, is nothing but the ratio of statistical weights of our ground and excited states. Delta is the delta E is the energy of activation in terms of H nu, K is the Boltzmann constant and T is the absolute temperature. From the above equation what we can understand is the N1 by N0 that is the ratio of atoms in the excited state to the ground state is dependent upon both excitation energy that is delta E and the temperature and the temperature. Therefore, an increase in temperature and a decrease in delta E will both result in higher value for the ratio N1 by N0. Increase in temperature means when the temperature increases, when the heat energy of the flame in, is increased, naturally more number of atoms can excite it, thereby more will be the intensity of the uh, color of, more will be the in, intensity of the color of the Bunsen flame. So, this is how the uh, this is the theory or principle behind the working of flame photometer or flame frame, flame photometric techniques. So, overall uh, there are certain elements like sodium, potassium, lithium, uh, chromium, uh, lithium or uh, barium, etc. These elements impart characteristic color to the flame. Whenever these elements, the compound solution of these elements are exposed to the flame, what happens? This finally will get dissociated to the respective elements and the atoms of these elements get excited and de-excited. During that process, they release energy in the form of radiations having the wavelength of characteristic colors, thereby the flame will get the characteristic color. And the intensity of the color of the flame is how, how, what will be the intensity of the color of the flame? How many atoms will be excited under the given condition is given by the Boltzmann equation. Now, we briefly go through how the instrument looks like. 
the flame photometric instrument how it looks like. See here there's, there is a Binson, uh, there is the Binson flame and there is a uh, fuel gas that is the uh, 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 fuel gas for, for, ma for making the Binson flame to be uh, produced and uh, there is a uh, air inlet and there is a drain, uh, there is an outlet here and here there is a lens, here is a filter and here is an amplifier and this is the display window. So, what happens is, here is the filter means we are going to use different filters. Uh, when we are estimating sodium, we use sodium filter. When we are estimating potassium, we use potassium filter. That means when we use sodium filter, what happens is the sodium filter will allow the passage of only the radiations of golden yellow radiation, wavelength having golden yellow radiation. Suppose uh, that means if you are using sodium filter, from, from the Binson flame radiations are generated, these radiations are passed through the lens, then pass through the filter, these radiations, overall light radiations will be the combination of uh, some blue color of the Binson flame as well as golden yellow color which is being produced. But this filter will allow the radiation, filters out all the other radiations, will allow the radiations having the wavelength of only golden yellow color. Therefore, these golden yellow color radiations will be passed through an amplifier and amplifier will amplify the signals and finally, the intensity of the golden yellow color is shown in the digital form in the display window. Clear? No. And here, what we do? We take the sample. For example, here we take the sodium chloride solution. Okay, sodium chloride solution. Here is a capillary tube. If it, it will be sucking the sodium chloride solution. If you are using sodium chloride solution, if you are using potassium chloride, it will be sucking potassium chloride. Anyway, so it will be sucking the solution into this mixing chamber. At the same time, air is also will be sucked into the chamber and the solution will be mixed with the air thereby entire solution will be in the form of the mist and the mist of the solution will be entering into the Binson flame, will be entering into the Binson flame. In the Binson flame, it will be, uh, solvent will be operated and it becomes solid, then dissociation, then the atoms of the metal, sodium will be excited and de-excited during that process they will be imparting golden yellow color to the flame. The golden yellow radiations pass through the lens and pass through the filter. Here only golden yellow radiations come out and signals are amplified. Finally, intensity of the golden yellow color is shown in the display window. This is how flame photometric instrument works in general. Okay. So, now we will see how to use this flame photometer in order to estimate sodium in a given sodium chloride solution in order to estimate sodium in a given sodium chloride solution. So, in order to estimate sodium in a sodium, given sodium chloride solution, how to use flame photometric technique we, we try to understand. As of now what we have understood, what is flame photometer? On what basis the flame photometer technique works? Uh, some of the elements import characteristic color to the flame, the intensity of the color depending upon the concentration of the uh, element in the given solution. Based on that, we measure the concentration of unknown solution of the same element with the help of flame photometry, how a flame photometry works, <coughs> how a flow, flame photometric instrument looks like, what happens, what are all the parts we understood. Now, we try to understand how to use this flame photometric technique in order to estimate <coughs> the concentration of sodium in the given sodium chloride solution. So, before that applications already we know that is concentration of elements like sodium, potassium, calcium, lithium uh, and other elements which impart characteristic color to the Binson flame can be estimated accurately and even when the concentration is lower we can estimate accurately. But the point here is as in the case of colorimetry where it is applicable only for the solutions, estimation of the solutions where they are colored. Here also flame photometry can be used only in the case of the elements which can impart characteristic color to the flame. Now coming to <coughs> the estimation of 
sodium by flame photometric technique. We know that sodium imparts bright yellow color to the Bunsen flame. Therefore, to estimate sodium, a filter which transmits yellow light is used. That is what is called as sodium filter. We use sodium filter here. Sodium filter which transmits only the sodium. If we, here there is a place to fix the, keep the filter. Whenever we estimate sodium in flame photometer, we use sodium filter here because sodium filter will allow the moment of only the golden yellow colored radiation. So now coming to the procedure, first what we do, we prepare the sodium chloride solution of concentration 1 ppm by dissolving around 2.542 grams of sodium chloride in 1 liter of distilled water. So by dissolving this much of sodium chloride in 1 liter of distilled water, we get sodium chloride solution of concentration 1 ppm. First we have to prepare 1 ppm concentration sodium chloride solution. Then what we do? We from that 1 ppm sodium chloride solution, we take 2 ml, 4 ml, 6 ml, 8 ml and 10 ml of that sodium chloride. So we are preparing sodium chloride solution of 1 ppm in the beginning, right? Because we know the concentration as 1 ppm, we call it a standard solution of sodium chloride. From that standard solution of sodium chloride, we take 2 ml, 4 ml, 6 ml, 8 ml and 10 ml, 5 different concentrations into 5 different 100 ml flasks, into 5 different 100 ml flasks and we add distilled water and we dilute up to the mark. Thereby, we are preparing, we are taking 2 ml of sodium chloride of concentration 1 ppm into a 100 ml flask and we are adding water up to the mark thereby we are diluting it to 100 ml. 4 ml diluting it to 100 ml therefore finally we are going to get the 0 0.02, 0 0.04, 0 0.06, 0 0.08 and 0 0.1 ppm of sodium chloride solutions respectively. Okay, We are going to get 5 different flasks, 5 different sodium chloride solutions of different concentrations. 0 0.02 ppm, 0 0.04 ppm, 0 0.06 up to 0 0.1 ppm respectively. And another flask, in another flask what we do, we take sodium chloride or we will be given with sodium chloride but we don't know how much is given. 5 ml may be given, 7 ml may be given, 6 ml may be given, we don't know. But in another, another 100 ml flask, some sodium chloride solution will be given of unknown volume. We have to find out how much is being given by conducting the experiment. So another 100 ml flask, some sodium chloride solution will be given. To that also add distilled water up to the mark, mix it well for uniform concentration. Then what you do, first what you have to do is in the flame photometer, we have to here you keep after preparing solutions of different concentrations of sodium chloride. And you are also having test solution with you, whose concentration is not known to us. Then what you do, here in the beaker, first you take distilled water. You take distilled water and switch on the instrument. Flame will be burning. This distilled water does not contain any element. Therefore, when the distilled water is being sucked into the chamber, here it is introduced, distilled water is introduced here there is no change in the color of the flame at all because there are no sodium elements, no other element. Therefore, the reading must be 0. The reading is what? This instrument shows the reading, shows what? Shows intensity of the yellow color of the yellow color of the flame. There is no yellow color with distilled water. Therefore, reading must be 0 or otherwise set the reading to 0. Set the reading to 0. Then what you do afterwards? In the same beaker, now you take 10 ml sodium chloride solutions, 10 ml sodium chloride solution. That is out of all the 5 different or 6 different flasks, highest concentration of sodium chloride is where? Wherever you have taken 10 ml of sodium chloride, that solution you keep it here. That solution is keep it. Because the highest is the highest concentration of sodium chloride you have taken here, the flame will be burning with golden yellow color of highest intensity among all the different solutions. Highest in intensity among all the different solutions. So therefore, the reading must be 100, right? Among all the solutions you are preparing, highest concentration of sodium is present in 10 ml sodium chloride solution flask. Therefore, whenever you take 
this uh, 10 ml sodium chloride solution in the beaker, the flame will be burning with golden yellow color of highest intensity and the reading must be 100. Therefore, set the reading to 100 here. So, therefore, the first readings, first two steps, you are taking the distilled water, setting the reading to 0, then you are taking highest concentrated sodium chloride solution, setting the reading to 100. Then what you do? Again, you run the machine by using distilled water. Therefore, the capillary will be clean. Then you keep the 0 0.02 ppm sodium chloride solution. Run the machine, note down the reading. It will be burning with some yellow color. It shows the reading, note down the reading. It may be show the reading as 20 or 18, whatever it is. Then again, you run the machine by uh, using distilled water, set the reading to 0. Then you take 0 0.04 ppm, then 0 0.06, then 0 0.08. Finally, you take test solution here. For test solution, how much ever the reading it shows, note down. In this way, you are completing the experiment in a matter of hardly 10 to 15 minutes. So, once you note down the, complete the experiment, what you are doing? You are noting down or you know with you now what is the intensity of, what is the percentage of intensity of the golden yellow color with 0 0.02 ppm solution, 0 0.04, 0 0.06, 0 0.08. You also know the intensity of the yellow color with respect to the test solution. Once you note down all these things, once you conduct the experiment, and once you note down all those things, once you note down all those things, see whatever I have explained that is being given here, that is we are preparing different solutions and we are placing the distilled water, distilled water and set the reading to 0 and we are placing the highest concentration, set the reading to 100, then we place the different solutions each time and we repeat the procedure, note down the reading. And finally, you have to draw a graph of the into emission intensity against concentration of sodium chloride in ppm. So, emission intensity for each solution we have measured by using flame photometer. Then you plot a graph of emission intensity versus concentration of sodium chloride. From the graph, we can find out the concentration of sodium chloride in the unknown solution as it is shown here. Emission intensity along the y-axis, concentration of sodium along the x-axis in terms of ppm. So, for 0 0.02, what is the in emission intensity? Put the point for 0 0.04, 0 0.06, 0 0.08 and you draw a straight line passing through maximum possible number of points and also passing through the origin. Then for the test solution, we do not know the concentration but we know the emission intensity because for the test solution also, we are measuring the emission intensity. So, Find out where the emission intensity is there for test solution. From there, you draw a perpendicular to touch the curve. From there, you draw one more perpendicular to touch the x-axis. Wherever it touches the x-axis, it is nothing but concentration of sodium in the test solution. So, this is how, dear students, we can easily measure the concentration of sodium in the given test solution by using flame photometric technique. And the same way, this technique can be applied for measuring the concentration of any other uh, any other element in the respective solutions provided those elements impart characteristic color to the bins and flame. So, therefore, overall in this session, we understood about colorimetric estimation, theory, instrumentation of colorimeter and uh, we discussed about, we understood about how to estimate copper in unknown solution by using colorimetric technique. Then we discussed about flow, uh, flame photometric uh, estimation technique, what is the theory instrumentation behind the flame photometric technique and we also understood how to measure sodium in the unknown solution by using flame photometric technique. Thank you.